Some encouraging news about the economic recovery in China and the United States. We'll discuss expectations for 2024. Hello, I'm Arnold Neidem and this is The Heat. The world's largest economies, China and the United States, are showing signs of resilience. The governor of the People's Bank of China said this week China will achieve its GDP growth target of about 5% in 2023 and will maintain healthy and sustainable growth in 2024 and beyond. In the United States, the Commerce Department announced the U.S. economy grew by 5.2% from July through September, faster than expectations. Interest rates remain at a 22-year high as the U.S. Federal Reserve works to slow the economy and lower inflation. Well, for more on all of this, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Portland, Oregon, is Yang Liang. She's the Chair Professor of Economics at Well Amet University. Also with us, Anthony Chan is a former Chief Economist with J.P. Morgan Chase & Company in New York. And John Gong is a Professor of Economics at the University of International Business and Economics in Beijing. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. John Gong, uh, the outlook from the People's Bank of China, the Chinese Central Bank, is optimistic. But the governor of the bank did say we should be aware that China is currently undergoing changes to its growth model. Uh, so what's your assessment of the Chinese economy right now and where it's heading? I think uh, overall, uh, China's economy is still in a mood of recovery. Uh, we, we're starting to see some signs of recovery um, in September, in October. Um, and um, um, but it's still, you know, I would say very uh, modest recovery. Uh, it still faces a lot of challenges. Um, I mean, the real estate sector is recovering, um, and 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 it still, I think, it still takes some time for the government's um, fiscal and, and and monetary uh, stimulus policies to take effect. Uh, so overall, I think um, the. Um, the, the statistics we're seeing um, are still quite modest, in my view. But I think uh, um, I, I totally agree with the, the central bank that uh, and we have uh, one month left, uh, that the whole year objective of about 5% uh, should be able to be achieve, uh, uh, achieved. I'm sorry. So, John, when you say modest, um, can you see the growth increase substantially, significantly in 2024? Um, well, I think uh, getting to 2024, we should be uh, more optimistic. Uh, definitely, uh, you know, this is going to be some time after some quite strong uh, stimulus policies coming from the central government should be taking effect. Um, I think definitely should be more than 5%. Um, that's, uh, you know, given China's uh, economic size at this point, uh, something more than 5% uh, is actually still. Uh, very great achievement. Uh, it's not easy for an economy of this size, um, you know, uh, 60, 17 trillion dollars of size going at uh, over 5 percent is something very remarkable already. Yang Liang, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, says China's real GDP is expected to grow to 5.2% in 2023. And that's actually in line with the figure we got from the IMF about a month ago. I think they uh, cited a similar figure, 5.2%. What do you make of the assessment so far? Right. I think uh, this is probably a optimistic reading of the Chinese economy, which I think also reflects the reality. We have seen numbers from September, October, you know, retail sales have gone up by 6.7 percent, industrial expansion 4.8 percent, um, real investment um, has also gone up by, you know, 2.9 percent, despite the real estate sector was dragging down the real investments. So I think all of these are signs that the economy is on way to relatively, you know, robust recovery and growth. And so achieving that 5 percent official target, I think it, it's pretty uh, certain. Now, the question, of course, is going forward. Um, there are a lot of still concerns about the economy in terms of, you know, consumer spending, in terms of private entrepreneurs' uh, investment drive, in terms of, you know, international relations and, you know, export demands and so on and so forth. So I think if China continues with the expansionary fiscal uh, policy, like what they wrote out, this one trillion uh, yuan bond sales uh, and transfer the funds 
wants the local governments to help with to, to manage their debt, if they continue to do that and they continue to stabilize the real estate sector, for example, helping to uh, complete the unfinished projects, um, the housing projects, um, and also you know uh, continue to encourage uh, and and you know support the private enterprises, then I think all of this will help China to achieve maybe another four. 4.5 or 5 percent of growth rate. Now, going forward, I think there is still the question remains about whether or not China will embark on some sort of structural reforms, um, for example, you know, relaxing cocoa restrictions, um, trying to uh, pivot towards more social spending and help the consumers to regain confidence, and even, you know, provide some kind of a job guarantee to help to fix the youth unemployment problems. I think those things are remain to be seen. Um, but again, I share with the optimism with my colleagues and also with these international institutions and the central bank that I don't think, you know, the whole uh, Western media's claim of the end of China's miracle is it's materializing. Right, Nian Yang, you mentioned the real estate issues in China. I mean, we've been hearing of that for some time. Um, what do you expect to see happening there to fix that? Right. So I think, you know, um, the government has been promoting uh, certain policies, but again, they're very targeted. So the bottom line is they're not going to go back to the old model of the credit field, you know, highly leveraged, highly, uh, you know, uh, sort of credit driven investment approach. But what they are doing is trying to stabilize the market. So first of all, we don't see a huge collapse in the real estate market in terms of the price. So I think that is very successful. And, you know, the real estate housing in investment uh, used to be 11 percent of the GDP, the direct construction. And now it's down to you know six percent. And housing used to uh, the real estate sector you know used to consume about twenty seven percent of the bank loans, and now is very much low, uh, you know one percent or two percent. So I think we're in this period of adjustments. Um, so what the government trying to do is again, like I said, trying to complete all those unfinished projects. Evergrande itself has about. 600,000 units to be completed. So I think that is very essential because that is the way to, you know, provide a housing to those homeowners who have already paid upfront. Um, the other things is that, that that we just recently see is the government is is going to double down on, um, you know. Uh, social housing project and also the Shanty Town revitalization project. So these would help to uh, again to stabilize the, the market. Anthony Chan, let's look at the picture here in the United States. The U.S. Commerce Department is reporting that the U.S. economy grew by 5.2 percent. That's in the third quarter of 2023. Um, what's driving growth here in the United States, and what do you expect for this quarter, the fourth quarter? Well, certainly what you see in the, in the United States is very strong consumer spending, even though the third quarter did get you a, a little bit of a downward revision to consumer spending, but it's still relative to the trend, uh, very robust. So the U.S. economy is very strong in the third quarter. But it's funny because when you look at the third quarter numbers, you think that that's representative of what's happening the entire year in the U.S. economy, and it is not. I think that this year, when you look at the entire year, we're going to probably get something like around 2.4% uh, real GDP growth for 2023. Uh, and that, of course, compares to China, which is probably going to get you something in the neighborhood of about 5%. So it is much stronger in China than it is in the U.S. And so I think that the third quarter number is a little bit misleading. And I say that because if you look at the fourth quarter, we know that we're probably going to see a real GDP number with a 1% handle. We just got the Atlanta Federal Reserve, which is a very good barometer of what's happening to real GDP almost in real time, and that number varies across time, uh, that number is probably is already telling us that we're going to see something in the neighborhood of about 1.2 percent or so in the fourth quarter. So things are slowing down in 2023 as you go into the fourth quarter. And then next year, we're going to see even a greater slowdown, but we're going to see growth uh, somewhere below 2 percent. I suspect something around 1.5 percent, which is not bad because potential growth in the United States is 1.8 percent, but it is nothing like a 4 or 5 percent growth rate that people were hoping for. So when you look at that uh, relatively low growth rate, 1.2 percent, as you said, Anthony, um, what does that tell us about the fears of a recession next year? Well, I put the odds of a recession for next year at about 30 percent, but that, of course, tells you that I believe there's a 70 percent chance of no recession. Anytime you slow the economy down to a 1% handle, you obviously increase the risk of something going wrong, a risk factor, an exogenous development that uh, could occur 
that can push us easily into two consecutive quarters of negative economic growth. The good news is that the Federal Reserve is probably going to be coming in right. sometime uh, uh, before the middle of the year and, uh, and probably try to adjust rates to minimize uh, the probability of a recession. But I, I would still put it at around 30 percent. Yeah. Well, actually, the uh, Federal Reserve is meeting on the 12th and 13th, Anthony. Um, the benchmark interest rate right now is in that range 5.25 to 5.5. As we pointed out at the beginning of the show, it's the highest level in 22 years. Um, I mean, what do you expect out of that meeting later this month? I think what I'm going to expect is basically we're going to update their uh, economic projections for real GDP, uh, for unemployment, uh, for growth. Uh, and I think that those numbers are going to, in fact, suggest that sometime, uh, at least by the middle of next year, we'll see the Federal Reserve sort of preparing uh, the overall economy to lower rates. I say that because that is my view. But if you look at financial markets and the futures markets, they're expecting you know, the probability of a, of a cut in rates as early as the first quarter. And by the second quarter, uh, more than a 95 percent chance that interest rates will have been cut either by 25 or 50 basis points. I actually believe they can afford to wait either until late in the second quarter or more likely to lower interest rates in the third quarter. John Gong, uh, this week China hosted the China International Supply Chain Expo. It was attended by more than 500 uh, companies, um, Chinese and foreign enterprises uh, being at that event. The Chinese Premier Li Chiang delivered the keynote speech. Let's listen to some of what he had to tell uh, people at the expo. As the countries around the world are looking for robust and sustainable growth drivers amid a faltering global recovery, consolidating and enhancing cooperation on global industry and supply chains, accommodate the interests and aspirations of all parties. As President Xi Jinping noted, maintaining the resilience and stability of the global industry and supply chains is a vital guarantee for promoting the development of the global economy. China initiates the ASPO to meet the calls of the times and create an international platform for closer communication, deeper cooperation, and shared development. So, uh, John, China wants to make supply chains uh, more resilient, more efficient, more vibrant. What are the challenges it faces right now? Well, I think the challenges coming from the uh, geo strategic geopolitical angles. Um, as you know, the you know, United States is engaging a grand competition. It's emphasizing de-risking, uh, even though uh, early on the catchphrase is uh, decoupling. Um, and, um, and the European Union is pretty much doing the same thing. Um, I think the, the interpretation of de-risking uh, is that um, the both sides, I mean, the, the, the European Union and the United States, uh, want to um, change the situation that in certain industries, certain products, it wants to uh, change the situation of over-reliance uh, on supplies sourcing coming from China. Um, so the, I think th this represents the biggest challenge. Uh, even though China, you know, from a production point of view, from a logistic point of view, uh, is absolutely committed to maintaining, um, you know, the resilience and reliability of the supply chains. Uh, but, you know, there's an issue with on the demand side. Um, so, so I think, uh, you know, China, the Chinese government is doing its best trying to convince uh, the European Union and the United States that uh, uh, the supply chain coming out of China is going to be reliable and it's going to be resilient. Uh, but you know, it's just been politicized. I think that's the biggest challenge. Yang Liang, there was a report uh, from a German research institute that shows that Chinese manufacturers sold 3.4 million vehicles overseas from January to September. Um, industry analysts predict that China will become the world's largest vehicle exporter for this year. Um, what impact does that have on China's economy? Right. So I think what that shows is that the industrial production is not only recovering in China, but also it's really upgrading. Um, and I think that really meets China's long-term goal, which is trying to embark on the more pro uh, productively driven innovation, you know, led kind of growth. 
So I agree with what John was saying that uh, there's the geopolitical risk that really, uh, in a way, interrupt the global supply chain. But at the same time, I think China is also seeing that some of the old advantages that China enjoys, such as you know, young labor force, plentiful you know, young workers, that kind of advantage is probably not gonna stay forever. So it is time for China to upgrade and try to move up the uh, industrial supply chain. And so I think the most recent efforts in developing you know, automobile industries, especially the new energy vehicles, is one of the manifestation, I think, of China's efforts and uh, its result to upgrade the supply chain, to upgrade its um, value chain. Um, so I think we expect to see more of this coming out from China. Um, China is already leading in many of the renewable energies in the uh, green technologies. Um, and China is providing, you know, 80% of the supply of uh, the solar panels and 40% of the wind turbines and 80% you know, of the lithium processing. So I think, you know, we will expect to see China continue to grow its ability um, to, to produce the high value added products. That said, I think definitely there will be more headwinds coming from, you know, countries like the United States or European Union countries um, that would in some ways, you know, trying to engage in competition with China, but hopefully the competition will be you know, uh, constructive and fair um, rather than, you know, trying to ban exports of high tech or trying to uh, initiate the so-called investigation and anti-subsidy uh, probe and so on and so forth. Yang Liang, you know, uh, John was talking a moment ago about how many aspects of uh, trade, uh, well, things like trade itself, manufacturing, logistics have become politicized, and we're seeing that again right now. In fact, the United States on Friday unveiled new rules uh, which tell us that the U.S. Uh, wants to keep Chinese components out of electric vehicles that are manufactured here in the United States. Um, what is the significance of that? And critics of that particular policy here in the United States say that it will actually slow down the adoption of electric vehicles in this country. Absolutely. I think that is the biggest concern. Um, I think, you know, climate change is real um, as the COP28 is happening right now. I think we all need to recognize that uh, we have to accelerate the green transitions and adopting EV is one very important aspect of the United States. You know, the transportation industry uh, account for 30 percent of the CO2 emissions in the United States. And in the U.S., the EV uh, penetration rate is fairly low, right, less than 10 percent. So I think it's very important for countries to work together towards that common global challenge um, of climate change and accelerate, you know, the EV uh, adoption um, rather than pitting against each other. And I think there's definitely ways to divide the labor along the supply chain, along the EV uh, manufacturing and research and, you know, uh, after sales uh, services. And many of the value added aspects of the supply chain can be divided up between countries. It's not a win winner take all. It's not, you know, a zero sum game. So um, I, I think it makes sense to some degree that you know the United States needs to develop its own sort of green industries by investing in itself, but at the same time, I don't think um, it's it's a zero sum game, uh, and and that needs to be uh, really dealt with. Anthony, you were telling us a moment ago about expectations for the fourth quarter year in the United States, uh, and if we look at some key numbers um, that came out just a few days ago, uh, the Black Friday and Cyber Monday sales hit record numbers in the U.S. According to Adobe Analytics, e-commerce sales topped $12.4 billion. That's up 9.6% from last year. So what is driving that? Well, uh, unfortunately, something that is uh, driving it is the buy now, pay later uh, type of uh, payment mechanisms that over 40% of all those sales were financed that way. And that is showing you that there is a little bit of consumer stress. And when I say consumer stress, uh, I basically look at the consumer almost in two different buckets. You have the upper income uh, individuals that are doing very, very well, and then you have the lower income individuals that are a little bit more stressed and are finding that the $1.1 trillion in credit card debt that we have right now is somewhat of a constraint. Uh, you have a lot of workers in the United States that feel financially insecure. And I say that in the same uh, world or in the same environment, where from the fourth quarter of 2019 to the second quarter uh, of this year, the latest numbers from the Federal Reserve show us that household net worth increased by $37.6 trillion. That's a number that's bigger than the entire 
national debt that we've accumulated in over 200 years. So there's a lot of wealth out there, and that is the reason why the economy is still doing well. The top 20 percent of consumers spend about 40 percent of all the consumer spending that takes place in the United States, but that lower income uh, strata or cohorts are, in fact, uh, struggling. And you see that with the pay now, pay now, buy now, and pay later. Yeah. Obviously, the, the top 20 percent of uh, income earners are not using that uh, technique. But right now, the consumer is doing very well. We know that the University of Michigan showed you four consecutive months of declines in consumer confidence. The conference board did give you a little bit of a pickup. But by and large, consumer confidence relative to where it was several months ago is still low. And I think it's because you've got a lot of consumers particularly more than 50 percent of them, feeling a little bit of stress in this kind of an environment. Right. Anthony, what about the property market in the United States? Uh, interest rates are very high. In fact, the 30-year fixed rate right now is 8 percent. I mean, that's much higher than it was, say, in 2021 or 2022. Uh, what, what is that doing to the property market, the high interest rate? Well, I think if you look at the housing market, uh, it's, again, it's a tale of two cities. If you look at existing home sales, which are virtually over close to 80 percent of all the market, uh, that market is seeing price uh, pretty, pretty good resilient strength in terms of prices, and prices still showing acceleration. If you look at new home sales, uh, you're seeing a little bit more inventory. You don't have much inventory in the existing, but in the new home sales market, which is a smaller uh, piece of the pie, uh, you have inventories that are above the six-month average, uh, and you're also starting to see some price uh, retrenchment, obviously due to the higher mortgage rates. But the only reason why you're not seeing that in the existing home is because there are a lot of people out there that took out mortgages uh, at 4 percent or 3 percent. In fact, the lion's share of all the mortgages outstanding were obtained at 4 percent or less, and they don't want to list their home to buy another home and have to take that mortgage at 7 plus, approaching 8 percent that you just pointed out. So that is the reason why there are problems on the existing home sales. But to the extent that interest rates come down, and of course the 10-year Treasury rate has come down, and you're going to see that mortgage rates will follow, that should help a little bit. But until inventories start to pick up at the existing homes uh, uh, activity, you're not going to see the housing market really making much, uh, much progress. You're going to continue to see very little uh, uh, transactions, and the few transactions mean that they're going to continue to be upward price pressures for existing homes, but not so much on the new home sales market. Right. John Gong, if we look beyond the world's two biggest economies, China and the United States, if we go across to look at Europe, uh, inflation rates there are dropping uh, two point. 2.4 percent in November, but the, the continent's biggest economy, uh, Germany, uh, is struggling. Um, its economy is expected to shrink by 0.5 percent next year, half percent. Why is the German economy having such a battle? Uh, before I answer your question, uh, I want to add a note to what Anthony has just said. I think um, one worrying sign of the real estate property market in the United States is, the, is that default rates is indeed starting to spike, actually. Um, and I think um, in, at a, such a high mortgage rate at this time, um, you know, it's a matter of how long that the, 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 the consumers uh, that are in trouble uh, can hang on. Uh, and, and I think, uh, you know, there's some talk about uh, increasing default rates uh, in the real estate market. This is a very worrying sign. Now, back to your question um, in, in Germany, I think uh, the biggest uh, lingering effect is still the ongoing war in Ukraine. Uh, if this war doesn't stop, uh, German's economy is not going to come back. Um, and, um, you know, this is uh, against the backdrop that the continued funding of this war from Washington. Uh, looks to be uh, drying up at this point. It's can, can becoming increasingly difficult for Congress to um, <clears throat> to uh, to uh, um, dose out another, you know, 30, 40, 60, uh, uh, up to a 60 billion dollars for Ukraine, and the the gap has to be largely picked up by uh, by, by by Europe, and and that's mostly Germany, in, in my view. Uh, so with that big burden and with that lingering. Um, 
uh, fact, uh, German economy is not going to come back anytime soon. So I think, uh, again, uh, peace is the solution to German economy, to European economy. Uh, and without peace, um, it's not going to go anywhere. And Yang Liang, just getting back to uh, the United States and China for a moment, uh, do you expect any kind of movement in the near future, perhaps next year, on tariffs? Unfortunately, no. I don't think this is going to be the case um, because I think, you know, despite all the talks about, uh, you know, foreign relationships, I don't think the Biden administration is going to take any substantive uh, changes in, in their policies against China. Uh, not to mention next year is the election year. So I think, you know, there's a lot of political toughness that, you know, the Biden administration needs to display. So, um, and, you know, again, with the U.S.'s inflation coming down, I, say, I think they see even less of a pressure uh, to scrap away that punitive tariffs on the Chinese imports. Um, if I may, I also wanted to piggyback on, you know, the previous uh, question on the German economy. Yeah. I think this, uh, you know, um, in addition to those long-term problems of, for example, you know, losing or lacking skilled labor on the one hand, and yet having an unemployment rate of 5.8 percent, and also very outdated, you know, public infrastructure, especially in the digital infrastructure, I think the biggest blow to the German economy right now is the fiscal tightening. Um, that 60 uh, billion euro spending on green transition, which really galvanized a lot of private investors, now is ruled by the Supreme Court as illegal. So, you know, there is a huge fiscal tightening, I think, down the road, and that is going to really weakened economy. And the United States, on the other yeah. hand, I think, you know, what really has helped the consumers is don't forget that they had the as a savings of $2.1 trillion uh, yeah. back in 2021, thanks to the stimulus checks. Right. But those who are not going to force coming again, um, and the, 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 you know, Treasury is sending, you know, over $659 billion interest right. payments to the private sector every year, I mean, into, in this year. So all of these, I think, helped bolster the consumer demand. Yeah. Um, but I Young agree with Man, Anthony. I I am yeah. rapidly running out of time, and I just wanted to get your views on one other uh, development this Absolutely. week, and that was the death of Henry Kissinger. He died at the age of 100, a very controversial figure, but he was uh, known in China. Uh, in fact, the Chinese foreign ministry described him as an old and good friend. How will he be remembered in China? Right. So I think you said it right, that he's a very controversial figure. But in China, I think, you know, uh, people really respect him and trust him. And um, they really admire his real politic approach, um, that the, he was able to, you know, uh, risk his personal lives, right? He traveled at the age of yeah. 99 to China last year, um, right. and he was able to put away, you know, the differences in value and right. ideologies and try to broker, you know, the normalization of relationships. So okay. I think he will be uh, remembered well. Okay, that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arun Naidu in Washington, D.C.